Progressive presents Adjusting to the Suburbs. It never dawned on me how much walking I used to do until I bought a house in the suburbs. Like when I'd say, I'm going for coffee, of course I was walking. But now it's like three miles, and no latte's worth that. I find myself inviting people on walks with me, like it's a scheduled activity. This morning, my neighbor asked me what I'm doing, and I actually said, I'm going for a walk with Nancy. Anyway, when you save with Progressive by bundling your home and auto, that's the easy part of adjusting to the suburbs. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company coverage provided in service by affiliates and third-party insurers. Welcome to the Elevate Podcast. Conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Christy Wallace and Maricela Carrera. Hello and welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is my host, Christy Wallace, with my co-host, Maricela Herrera. Why are you laughing already? Because you said this is my host. Oh. <laughs> Why? Well, we're going to keep it. It's, all, it's always fun to uh, make fun of yourself a little bit, you know? There's humor in uh, laughing off the mistakes. And there's and, uh, power in humor. Yes. See, it all comes full, full circle back to power. Maricela, why has it been such an exhausting week? I mean, I know a couple of weeks ago you had mobilized women, you uh, and your team and the whole Elevate team just did really powerful and amazing work around bringing our community together, and connecting them to uh, different topics, different experiences, identities, and more importantly, connecting them to action in ways that we show up for each other in the workplace and in the world. So I know you're coming off of that. Uh, what else has been on your mind lately? Yeah, I'm definitely coming off the high of Mobilized Women still. You know, it's it's one of my favorite projects uh, every year. I'm very passionate about it. But I'm also incredibly passionate about growing our community because I believe that there is strength in numbers. And September is a time where we know we can have an impact with people, people coming back to work, um, kind of the men- the mentality of like moving from the summer to to fall and and getting ready to close off the year, which sounds crazy, but close off the year in a way that's strong. And so during September, we we do our annual discount for new members in our community. And so we're 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 working through that. And the, I'll be honest, the last few months, we've been hard at work at elevate, changing, making a lot of changes, uh, creating a free access for more people to join our community and be able to be part of this powerful coalition and be more inclusive. We also did lots of changes into our access level structure so that people can find what they're really looking for, not just in terms of what Elevate offers, but also the people within Elevate. Um, And September just is, it's go time for us. It's go time to make sure that we are showcasing all the great things that we're doing um, to showcase the wonderful people in our community and make this stronger. So, you know, we talk about mobilizing through mobilized women, but I, I think the more of us that are mobilizing, the better, the better it is for the whole world. I agree. And, you know, to be, to be honest, um, the past couple of months have been hard. I think it's been hard for all of us. I, I will speak for myself. It's It's been a, a lot of ups and downs with the pandemic, leading a business during that time, trying to navigate homeschooling children, uh, multiple children who do not want me as their teacher, and everything in between. And, and I would say that my weekly roundtable with the corporate executives in our community has really sustained me. Uh, it, we've talked about you know, how we advocate against racism in our in our workplace. We talked about how we lead teams that are now remote or maybe struggling with mental and emotional health issues. We've talked about how we continue to advocate for ourselves and to grow in our careers. There's so many themes that are top of mind for executives and being able to, to have that one hour a week where I'm committed to my community and to myself has meant a lot. I know we've been doing roundtables also for entrepreneurs, for career changers, for seasoned professionals and beyond. It's really about being able to come together as a community and learn from one another. But I've certainly been slacking a little bit on continuing to push myself in my own professional development. And I think many of us have done that too. It's been, you know, quite a whirlwind and a lot that's been on our minds and has kept us, you know, distracted from maybe that path that we were on. 
And so I encourage all of you as you head into the fall and looking forward to, you know, Q4 and 2021 and beyond to really invest in your career, to invest in finding that community that's going to support you, that's going to open doors, that's going to open your mind. And I hope that you'll join Elevate. I really hope so, too. Well, today, our guest actually is one of our local Elevate leaders. Julie Halunga is a leadership trainer and executive coach and author of On the Rise. And I, I have to say, you know, as we talk about the power of Elevate and community and being able to learn, I learned a great deal on this podcast, you know, so I have this habit, uh, which I actually just did with you, Maricela, in a meeting right before this, where I <laughs> ask permission to ask questions. I'm always like, can I ask a question? Uh, and so Julie and I talk about that and a whole lot more, you know, how we uh, handle those tough conversations in the workplace, negotiate for ourselves, communicate virtually and have those important conversations when maybe all the, the communication cues aren't there and a whole lot more. Julie has just a ton of insights and knowledge, and it was a great honor uh, to be able to, you know, pick her brain, if you will, and learn from her on our podcast this week. Yeah, Julie's fantastic. And, you know, she's one of our chapter leaders, and she's incredible. So I'm, I'm very excited that you had the conversation with her and can't wait to learn from it. All right, well, let's get to it. Julie, thank you so much for joining me today on the Elevate podcast. It's great to have you here. It's great to be having this conversation with you, Christy. I'm really excited to hear about your background. And I know there's a lot of enthusiasm there, but I, I just have found such inspiration in other stories and how they got to where they are today. I'm, I'm constantly speaking with um, mentees who are trying to plan the pathway forward and it feels so unknown and uncertain and it's the stories of others that give more clarity and depth to what that journey can look like. So would you mind sharing your story? Sure, sure. So I uh, was born and raised in, in New York but spent most of my childhood growing up overseas in Europe and Asia and started first grade in Paris where I did not speak a lick of French and as my grandfather promised me, I would be fluent by Christmas. And in fact, I was. And that experience growing up overseas really reinforced my interest in other people, my curiosity, my open-mindedness, because I was often the only white person, certainly in Asia, in a classroom, in a shopping center, uh, at the zoo. I distinctly remember my friend and I at a zoo in India, and she was bleach blonde hair and and there was as many people looking at her as looking at the uh at the tiger so sort of being in that mindset of of just be, wanting to learn about people and that just has stuck with me my entire life after graduating from college moved to Boston and uh started working at Harvard University and had the pleasure of meeting some really cool people and some famous people. And I developed my high standards for um, really the, the content that I put out and, and my written. I know that it always goes back to that experience at Harvard. Uh, while we were in Boston, I also got my MBA at Boston College. And just before we left Boston, I was working at Harvard Business School, working on an initiative examining women in the workforce and basically the infrastructures that were not in place to support them, to advance them, to re-recruit them if they had taken a leave of absence. And while I was at the business school, uh, we gave I gave birth to our daughter, who's now 14, and that reinforced my true passion for wanting to support women, wanting to help them advance in their careers and really think about what obstacles were in were gotten my way when I was younger in my career, how I got in my own way. And when we moved away from Boston, we we moved to Canada where my husband is from. And it reinforced this true passion that I have to work with people in their careers and to help them advance. 
in a way that works for them and not sort of looking at what the person next door is doing, but really what energizes them, what fuels them and what drains their energy. So about almost 10 years ago now, I started my own leadership development and executive coaching practice. And I focus on people who are looking to advance and to level up their careers, mostly within the professional services space, not completely exclusively. And of course, my passion around the careers of female leaders continues to this day and really helping people build up that skill set that they were never taught in school. None of us were ever taught in school so that they can lead with influence and authority. I love so much, Julie, how our history shape us. You know, growing up in, you know, first that resiliency of learning French by Christmas and and being in this new environment to, you know, moving around the world and experiencing different cultures and also, you know, how that is framed within your own identity uh, to the professional landscape and the experiences you have that leave a mark on you, uh, that inspire you, that kind of send you in a different direction. I know you focus a good deal on this concept of becoming conflict competent. And I want to talk about what that means, because I'll be honest. I mean, personally, I shy away from conflict. It's something that I'm not always comfortable with. And and I think many of us aren't, um, or maybe we have a misperception about conflict, that it's a bad thing versus a a thing that moves us forward. And and I really want to hear more about your thoughts on that. Sure. So you're not alone, Christy, and most people do shy away. I mean, think about any time you hear the words, can I give you some feedback? Most people I know, they tell me that their shoulders shoot up to their ears and they, you know, that's sort of, you become automatically, you put up this wall of of defense because it's, oh my gosh, feedback. And it's the same thing with conflict. Like, I just don't want to deal with it. And I often tell stories about my mom, who's this unbelievable woman, quite accomplished in her own right. Um, And she likes to tell me that she uh, doesn't have to deal with conflict because she's a diplomat. And so I had to educate her on this whole idea of, you can be a diplomat, but they're obviously knowing my mom quite well, there's a an avoidance that happens and that makes conflict escalate. And so when I talk about to my clients and to audiences about becoming conflict competent, it's really figuring out what triggers you and puts you into conflict, what escalates that conflict for you, and what are some things that you can do to raise your awareness and to handle the conflict so that you're not avoiding it and you're not sticking your head in the sand, which I love my mom, but I think that's what she's doing. Um, And so really helping people be okay with conflict because that's the biggest misconception is that conflict is all bad. In fact, there are a lot of great things that have come out of conflict. I mean, think about you're dealing with some kind of challenge or you're trying to come up with a new service or program in your organization, when you're, when everyone's in agreement, you're not coming up with great ideas. But when people are pushing back and saying, you know, well, how about this? Or that might not work, but here's an idea. That's when the richness really happens. And that's when great ideas come to fruition. I'd love to explore this a little bit more. I, um, you know, so when I'm for example, in a meeting, actually with Maricela too, this happens a lot, uh, who's my co-host on the podcast, right. but uh, we both have, have very strong opinions and conviction and not always in opposition, but not always necessarily in agreement. You know, we see things from different places and um, she's going to love that I'm calling her out here, but, um, <laughs> but no, but so when I approach it for me and I'm always trying to acknowledge, like, I acknowledge that this is how you see things, but this is how I see things. And like, how do we move forward from this place? And that to me is, um, that feels less scary, that type of, of com- you know, conversation. But then I'm also heading into conversations where I feel it's like, definitely, we don't see eye to eye. And it's very contentious, not with Maricela necessarily, but, you know, other, other professional conversations. And so I want to dig deeper. I always say this is my own personal like 
personal coaching session, but <laughs> so let's do that. Let's let's show your uh, the power of Julie. Yes. Which is, you know, give us some of those like tried and true tricks. How do we best navigate these situations that are everyday situations or maybe some of those outer liars that are those conversations we're avoiding uh, that that really get us anxious? Sure, sure. So the, the 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 message that I give to people is that there's basically two paths you can take when it comes to dealing with conflict. The constructive path or the destructive path. So to state the obvious, we want to be on the constructive path. All with the goal of de-escalating conflict. So I talk about their different levels of conflict and the first couple ones, it's a misunderstanding, a miscommunication, a difference of opinion. It's okay. We can, we can live in that space. You still want to be on that constructive path. What we're trying to stay away from and why I say de-escalate is we don't want to get to that fifth stage, which is polarization, because that's where people quit. That's where maybe you lose clients. It's where someone fires you because there's no coming back from it. So we want to rather recognize when conflict is being escalated so that we can de-escalate it. And the best way to do that, to stay on that constructive path. So the destructive path, and, and I always like to kind of have this image in my head of, okay, I'm at a crossroads. What am I going to do? The destructive path is where we are focused on the person and we're pointing the finger, we're playing the blame game. We're not taking responsibility for our own reaction or our actions or our role in whatever the situation might be. And we're really focused on the individuals and the personalities. And we're, we're being maybe subconsciously, but we're poking the bear a little bit. We, we may know, hey, if I say this or do this, it's really going to piss this person off. I find a lot of people who come hear me speak, they say, oh, yeah, I do that with my husband, or I do that with my wife, or I do that with my best friend. So we're aware when we're behaving not ideally. So rather, you're at that crossroads, take a moment, take a breath, and be really deliberate and choose that constructive path. And when you're focused on that constructive path, you are focusing on the task at hand. So it's not about the individual's It's not, you're not bringing the emotions, you know, she's after me or everything I say is wrong. We're putting that aside and you're really staying focused on whatever the challenge or the problem that, that, that task that you're trying to solve. So then you're, you're, you're trying to understand, wait, where is this other person coming from? And, you know, why are they, they coming from that direction? What is that other person trying to accomplish? And what does that other person think that you're trying to accomplish? And then really staying on that solution focused standpoint. Now I said, you know, we're taking emotions out of it, but what we're, what we're really doing is we're expressing our emotions. So oftentimes I find when people are avoiding, they're holding it in and they're my client this morning was talking about people he works with who are passive aggressive. So you know something doesn't sit with them, but they're not expressing what's going on. So I often talk about, you know, you might want to have a delayed response for for anyone out there who has kids who play youth sports. We've all seen those signs on fields, on courts, at rinks, you know, the 24-hour cooling off period before you approach a coach, before you know, you, you decide to express that emotion, take 24 hours. So I I call that a delayed response, which is different than avoiding. So a delayed response is I'm going to wait that 24 hours, or I'm going to wait till this afternoon. I'm going to sit on it. I'm going to think about it. And then I'm going to express my emotion. And I'm going to reach out to people to help understand their perspective, help them understand where I'm coming from. So all of those are really constructive tactics, which people can take to, to approach conflict. I'll let you know that this, all of this data and tactics 
um, comes from some work done um, out of uh, Eckerd College in Florida, and they have developed a profile called the Conflict Dynamics Profile. And it's just a really straightforward and tangible, actionable way to approach conflict. Thank you for all of that. I'm learning so much. And, and I'm going to bring it a little bit into where we are today, which is conflict during times of conflict. Yes. You know, um, the pandemic and racial inequalities, uh, there's so much happening in our world. And I think that we ourselves individually might be you know, having internal conflict how do we respond to this situation? Um, that's a new situation that maybe we haven't, you know, especially with the pandemic, had to address before. Um, and then how does that prepare us for the future? Mm-hmm. And I, I would just love to know, like, what are you hearing from your clients or what are your thoughts during this time when, um, you know, as you said, poke the bear, but it's it's the world, is it, you know, yeah. and, and what's happening is kind of poking you. And it's hard to know. I mean, I, I personally struggle with, okay, like, what do I do uh, when there's such a lack of clarity or information? Right, right. And this, my God, Christy, this is, these are times I hope we never have to experience again. But, you know, one of the thoughts that I always, I'm talking a lot these days, to no surprise, to my clients is really monitoring their own energy. So, you know, I've talked to people about limiting their news sources, limiting the notifications on their phone. So so managing their energy in that perspective so that when they face conflict in their own world, that they have as much strength as possible to deal with it and to recognize that not everyone is dealing with this situation in the same way. I think we can all agree that we have all been affected by it, in it but in very different ways. There's some people who have lost their jobs. There's some people who have taken a big pay cut. There are other people who are busier than ever, and they aren't having time to do the things that recharge them and re-energize them. So approaching it, really thinking about where is this person coming from? And even asking, hey, how are you handling remote learning you know, your kids being at home? How are you handling not being able to see family? Like really... What I hope continues post-pandemic is what I'm seeing is how people are connecting in a much deeper way and understanding the people that they work with or they interact with on a regular basis. Uh, Chrissy, I don't know if you've noticed this, but one of the things I've noticed with all of my clients that used to jump right into the work conversation, they're taking the time, sometimes (laughs) five minutes, to, to share, hey, how are you doing? How is everything that's going on affecting you? Um, how are your kids handling it? And I, I really, I know that that makes for better leaders when they're able to connect with people personally and truly understand where the other person is coming from. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned uh, conflict with kids and my heart started racing <laughs> at, the, at the thought of school starting back up again. If that's a whole other skill set is uh, when you've got your five-year-old refusing to do homework and you're just like, come on, you have to do it. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it is challenging. You know, we're playing different roles in our lives than uh, maybe we did before or in the way that we did before during a time that's uncertain and it really causes you to to, I think, be intentional and to think about it, right? You can't just fall back on your past experiences and what comes natural you're having to really address these situations as they come and that is intimidating Mm -hmm. um especially when your five-year-old overrules you which she does (laughs) all the time um and she is she's so stubborn oh my goodness she'll win every battle every day that'll serve her well in life later on just difficult on you (laughs) yes oh my goodness um but you know, another thing that I've been thinking a lot about is is this idea of how we communicate. And during a time when everything is virtual, how is that impacting some of these these conversations? I mean, I can't imagine, for example, the companies that unfortunately had to lose workers, you know, lay off workers during this time and, and having that conversation in a virtual environment versus in person. Um, I know it 
must be really difficult to understand how to best do that. So what are your thoughts on that? And how do we approach that type of situation? Right. I mean, we're all dealing with it. And I um, talk to people a lot about, you know, it's not exactly the same, but try to read someone's facial expression. So I can't even imagine having to be in the position of laying someone off over Zoom or Skype or, you know, whatever it may be, but paying attention to what is not being said. So I often advise people to look into someone's eyes and mouth and even looking at someone's forehead. That's where we see stress. And when we see it, to take a moment and say, hey, I'm noticing there's some emotion here or just slow yourself down and say, hey, how is this sitting with you? I know this is not easy. And demonstrating that that empathy and giving them just some space where you're not telling them something and you're not fixing something for them, but asking really good questions. So this I was leading a training last week where the, thankfully that this organization has not had to lay anyone off, but there's a lot of stress uh, involved with what they're doing and trying to support one another. And one of the things that I advise them and said is when someone comes to you to vent, don't feel that you need to fix it. That is our natural, from as a human being, that's our natural instinct, whether it's with a five-year-old or a 45-year-old. Our instinct is, let me fix this for you. And instead, to stop ourselves and to ask some powerful questions. And the one that I have in my back pocket when someone is venting to me, um, Christy, good luck with your five-year-old, because when they turn teenagers, call me back. We'll discuss that. But... Uh, this idea of like, what's the biggest challenge here for you? And the key words are those last two ones, you know, for you, because it, it forces that person to not just vent and, and get it out there, but to think about, wait, how is this impacting me? How is this impacting the way I'm able to do my job most effectively? And, and then you're slowing down, they might take a breath for a second, and then you can really be more present for them. On the other hand, for people who are on the phone or on Zoom all day long, which many of my clients are, many of us are, is to recognize that that you may not be able to sit in meetings from, you know, 10 hours a day on Zoom the same way you were able to in person to recognize that the screen that you have in front of you is a barrier. It takes so much more energy to look engaged, to come across as engaged. Uh, when you have that screen, it is a barrier. And when people are cognizant of that, I think that then they, they recognize, okay, this is what I really have enough energy to do. And most of my clients are saying that's about 20 to 25% less than what they were able to do, say, in February of this year. That's really interesting. I, uh, I mean, all of this is 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 so intertwined, and it's the language we use, and um, yeah, those situations, the coping mechanisms, the responses, like all of this, it it becomes, you know, as you're talking, it's it's not just a um, an easy solution, right? This is practiced, and it's it's complicated, but it's important. It's important that we really, you know, think about all layers of communication and conflict. Um, I know you have some really important thoughts around the language we use. And yeah. I want to, to dig into that. I, when my husband and I were getting married, we had gone to, I'm Catholic, so we went to, it's called pre-Cana, and it's this right. pre, premarital counseling. And the um, one of the things that was really important is the, the person who was leading the pre-Cana said, don't use absolutes. Like, don't mm -hmm. say you always or you never, because that immediately alienates someone. It immediately takes a conversation from one uh, that can progress to one that the door is shutting. And that we still, you know, one of us will say, you always do this. And the other one's like, do you remember pre-K and I? We're not supposed to say that. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of funny and it diffuses the situation. But what are your thoughts on, on language? And, you know, what are phrases that work, phrases that don't work? 
how is gender tied into this? Because yes. we hear so much about this like gender lens around, you know, the way women communicate, which angers me to no end, but I really want to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah. So I do see, I talk about this all the time. It is one of my favorite conversations around language, certainly given growing up in Paris and the obstacles I dealt with then uh, and how that's translated today. But I see it across the board, both men and women. And there is a difference in terms of what we are willing to accept when it comes to women's language. So sort of this balance, this double bind that women are in, given if they're too assertive, they're bossy. Um, but if they don't say anything, then they're, you know, a wet rag or that, you know, they're, they're a pushover. So finding this balance of using what I call strong leadership language and, and thinking about basically what I've bought, bottom line, what I've determined, the difference is the tone that we use. So how do we avoid being placed into the witch with a B, if you know what I'm saying, uh, status and being, <laughs> yes. being a, a strong woman who is able to lead with authority. And so some of the words that I talk about that we need to just eliminate from our vocabulary are phrases and words like I guess, or I believe, or I think. I get pushback on this sometimes because people say, well, what if I don't know? Or what if I'm brainstorming? Well, of course, if you're in a brainstorming session, the conversation, you're getting together with people to brainstorm, of course, say, I think this is the way to go. But if you are in a role where you are advising uh, colleagues or you have clients and you're advising them, in particular, they're paying you to advise them, you can't say, I think. Instead, you need to say phrases like, I recommend, or I am confident that, or I am convinced. That demonstrates your knowledge, your confidence, and people want to hear what you have to say. If you undermine yourself or put yourself in this one down position, you you can't influence people around you. And so another tip that I offer to people is to stop prefacing. If you have a question, ask the question. Don't skirt around it. Don't undermine yourself by saying this may be a dumb question or sorry for interrupting or this is one of my favorites but worst things that someone, I was speaking at a conference in New York a couple of years ago and, and she brought up um, I did ask if I could share it. She she used to be in the habit of saying, pardon my ignorance, but, and then no. ask her question. And she told me afterwards, I, I approached her and, and I said, why are you doing that? And she said, because I work, she's in professional services, but she's on the staffing. She's an executive director, but on the staff side. So she doesn't know all the intricacies of what, these partners do. So she likes to preface it by letting them know, I'm not where you are. So just explain this to me. And so we had that conversation. Well, what if you said, can you help me understand or explain to me what X, Y, and Z means? You don't need to tell people that you're ignorant. <laughs> I mean, and, and so she really understood what she was doing to the people. She, and she told me, she followed up with me a few months later that she was able to influence and make decisions and have people get on board with her simply by changing the language she was using. I mean, it was, it's unbelievable. Small changes that can have a massive impact. I love, I know I tend to say, can I ask a question? You know, yes. like asking permission um, yes. versus just being like, I have a question, you know, more, exactly. more assertive. Or, or just ask the question, Christy, like there's, <laughs> just jump right in. So I, I share the story that I had a colleague who we had been brought in to work with another consultant and we had an all day strategy meeting. You know, we've all been in those. They're, they're somewhat painful after a couple of hours. And I noticed this woman who was highly regarded, um, but in the, on this day was undermining herself every time she opened her mouth. She apologized. She you know, said, 
oh, wait, hold on. I just have a question. I'm not getting this. And, and so during the break, I pulled her aside and pointed this out to her. And I said, you are the most knowledgeable per person in the room when it comes to the client that we're talking about. Why would you undermine yourself? So every time she started to speak, I happened to be sitting next to her. I just flicked her under the table. Um, so the day ended. She had stopped doing it, but she had a bruise on her leg. So she wasn't so pleased with that. But she she recognized that, you know, it's a, it's a bad habit that we're all guilty of. But when we pay attention to what we're doing, then we can really stop the, the bad habits. Yeah, so true. All right, Julie, I want to ask you some questions to get to know you a little bit better. Sure. Uh, so are you ready for the lightning round? Yes. Okay. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? I technically am an extrovert. As I have gotten older, I will say I'm an extroverted who likes her introverted time. Uh, yeah. Yes. I, <laughs> I, I feel for introverted time. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite day of the week? Fridays, I um, tend to do more outside, work out more, and not schedule anything. So it's more of a impromptu day. Are you an early bird or a night owl? Early bird. Who's your dream dinner guest? <gasps> just one? Yes, just one. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Right now, Michelle Obama. Okay. Yes, Michelle is... Uh... I think on the top of the list for many of yes. us. Yes. Uh, what is your pet peeve? My pet peeve, I actually just recently found out there's a name for it. It's called misophonia, which is a strong dislike for the sounds of people, other people eating. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. my sister-in-law has that. Yes. <laughs> Makes me so self-conscious every time I'm around her now. I'm like, oh, can you hear me eating? Yeah. Um, I don't mind listening to my dog eat, but other people... Yeah, I do it. I, I get you. What is your favorite Monday morning staple? So activity, practice, food, drink. Um, I love working out first thing in the day and sort of the endorphins that come along. So uh, that gets me set up for the day and for the week. What's your favorite recent read? Ooh, um, so I reread. Uh, my grandmother's favorite book many times, and it's called A Woman of Independent Means. And it's fantastic. When was it published? Oh, you probably know? about 50 years ago. I'm, I'm trying to tell me more about this book. I mean, because in my mind, you say that and I have, and I think maybe because you, you prefaced it with your grandmother, but I have one right. of those like old red book lists, like what to do when your husband comes home from work. You know, be dressed up, smile, have a cocktail ready, a roast in the oven. Yeah, yeah so it's fiction, um, but it's um, letters written back and forth. And it's a, a, about a woman kind of talking about as she's growing up in life and how she isn't depending on anyone else. And my grandmother uh, has been passed away for uh, 17 years, 18 years now, but grew, you know, was born in the early 1900s, went to college when people weren't going to college, went to Barnard and uh, really was a woman of independent means and raised me not to be dependent on anyone and to make my own money and to make my own decisions. Uh, I'm happily married uh, for 20 years, but um, she really enforced in I'm the only granddaughter that this this need to to be independent and and be able to make decisions not because how they will impact people certainly she, you know I'm not just going doing whatever I want but she wanted me to have that ability um, that I could take a job or leave a situation because I knew it was the right thing to do and that book really speaks to to all of that I love that what is your top self care practice. Walking my puppy in the foothills of Denver. <laughs> it's the best. So sweet. Yeah. And what kind of dog do you have? Um, I like to say she's delicious, but she is uh, she's a mix of a Australian shepherd, maybe some golden, maybe some lab. We're not really sure. That's why I say she's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and what is one uh, question or thought you'd love to leave with our listeners today? I would love to leave with them, especially given our current times, is to be patient with yourself and cut yourself some slack. 
So if you're implementing any of the things that we talked about today to know that it takes time, as you said, Christy, it, it takes practice and just be aware of what's triggering you and when you just need a moment to step away. And Julie, thank you so much for joining us today on the Elevate podcast. This was such an important conversation always and especially during this time. And it was really great to catch up with you and to to learn uh you know how we can how we can really manage these conflicts better in some of these workplace conversations thank you christy this was a lot of fun thanks so much for listening to elevate if you like what you hear help a girl out subscribe to the elevate podcast on itunes give us five stars and share your review also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK, that's Elevate Network, and become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com. That's E L L E V A T E Network.com. And special thanks to our producer, Catherine Heller, She Rocks, and to our voiceover artist, Rachel Griesinger. Thanks so much, and join us next week.